Thank you. So as Ivan mentioned, I allowed a lot of time at the end for us to, to ask questions. It's just the second time I do this presentation and the first time I did the presentation. Uh, it took me three hours to go through the backlog of people asking questions in a separate room because we ran out of time on stage. So I don't think we're going to have three hours today, but I have a lot of time for your questions, so feel free. So uh, my name is Enrico Lefiers. I am the co-founder and gamer-in-chief at Bossa Studios. And you probably have heard of us because some of our most uh, known games are Surgeon Simulator and I Am Brad, which are one of the craziest games one can think of. Uh, in Surgeon Simulator, you are uh, just a left hand trying to do brain transplant in crazy places like the back of an ambulance hitting potholes, and it's all physics-based. In I Am Brad, you're just a slice of bread wanting to become toast. It's your, good in it's your goal in life. Uh, but what these games have in common uh, is that they are massive hits in terms of marketing, right? Uh, there are around 10 million videos made of these games. Some of these videos, more than 20 million views. So both these games are subculture on their own right on YouTube. Uh, there are more than 2 billion views among the videos that got made uh, of these two. And uh, we never had to buy any one of these videos. We never spent one dollar getting a video made, right? by a YouTuber or a Twitcher or, or a streamer or whatever. Uh, they did it because they like the game and they like what we did. Uh, but they also did it because of what I'm going to talk about, which is how we develop relationship with our players and how we are now taking that to a brand new level that has never been uh, uh, done before. Um, the talk today is what we call crowd development in, in how we source the power of uh, 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 the maker's generation, the people who are now unhappy to just consume things, but they also want to be part of creating these things, and how we, we use their help to, in the case of on, on Surgeon and Brad, uh, to carry on the message for us in the world, but in the case of Worlds of Drift, uh, to actually develop the game with us. So, uh, our story with UGC, uh, UGC stands for user-generated content. Um, it started with Surgeon and Brad. Um, most people consider UGC to be things like mods, levels, skins, right? We, we have a broader definition of UGC that also include videos, comments on Twitter, or on Facebook, or, or anywhere. Anything that the players make that is related to the game, we call user-generated content, right? It doesn't have to go into the game. But because we have this perspective, uh, when, for instance, I Am Brad went into early access, he shipped it with one bug where you could break the gravity of the game. So all the objects in the room will start floating around, and people start to make loads of videos making fun of us. So how can we ship a game that broken? So instead of just fixing the game, we fixed the game and added a zero-g level to the game. Right? So we are playing back on the joke that the players created on YouTube. In the same way, uh, there was this player called Machi, who was the world champion on uh, Surgeon Simulator. He could uh, 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 time the, the levels very fast, under seconds. And he did a video where he took the brain that he would have to put inside Bob's head, and he just threw it from far away, like lobbing a, a basketball, and he hit it. So what we did is what we added an achievement into the game, call it, uh, 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 it's just about skull, playing with just about skill, uh, that did exactly that in his homage. Uh, when we have a level, a secret level in Surgeon Simulator with the alien surgery, we name it each one of the organs of the, the, the alien after a famous YouTuber, like Pewdsball or Gaviskol and so on. So we created uh, this, this universe in that people who are making videos about our games felt that we were watching them. And everything that they were doing with our games, we were reflecting back in the game in every update. So we created this ecosystem between the people who played our games publicly and the players who played at home as well through analytics and so on by telling them what you do uh, when you play will make part of the game itself, right? So, and then this is why I empowered the whole thing of creating millions of videos and peop people making several videos of the same game rather than just one, is this feeling that everything that I'm doing today for my audience is being watched by the developers and they are taking that on board. Uh, there's no bigger example that the name Bob, the patient on Surgeon Simulator, was given by PewDiePie the first time he played the game. He started calling the patient Bob, 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 and we updated the game calling it Bob. Why not? Right? Of course, it doesn't go well all the time. 
This was always a player, also a player idea. At the time he wasn't president, he was very funny. Now I'm not so sure. <coughs> but while we were doing all of this, we were, we were listening to our players and creating games with them, uh, on, on creating content with them on Surge and I Am Bread, um, Minecraft was getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? It was happening. And if you think of it, uh, the sheer power of Minecraft, how huge it is, 100 million people playing it, more than 10,000 servers live at any given time, how many mods, how many skins, how much content is generated in every video it's made, in every article that is written. I, you will find very hard to compare this with any other game I know of out there right now. Um, and you have to remember that all this content is being made by the players, it's not the developers doing it, right? The developers don't even create content for Minecraft. Minecraft is a set of tools and systems uh, whose content is created by the players. Apart from the end dragon, everything else in Minecraft is about enable the players with mechanics and systems so they can do more of that. Minecraft is not the first game to do this, of course. Back in the early noughties, uh, we have things like Neverwinter Nights. Uh, it was a huge RPG that shipped it with a tool set called Aurora, which enabled the players to create their own quests, to modify the game and upload for others. This is one of the biggest examples of earlier examples of mods as well. Uh, Neverwinter Nights still have thousands of mods available and made, uh, but it was never as big as Minecraft because Minecraft is a convergence of things, it's not just the game. Minecraft appeared at the right place at the right time. If it was probably 15 to 20 years ago, Minecraft would not be as big because people would not be able to share videos about it, there was no tube around. Uh, you would not be able to download large files because the internet was damn slow. And the maker's generation wasn't there at that time. What I call maker's generation is these people today that are uh, part of our society that uh, write blog posts on Medium that thousands of people read. 20 years ago, if you have to write something for a thousand people, you have to be a published author. Right? Or if you make a video on YouTube that millions of people can watch, again, 20 years ago, you would have to work for a broadcast or make a film. So what we take to for granted today, that we just make stuff, 20 years ago wasn't like that. So we are a maker's generation, and because of that, we are no longer happy to just consume things. So what is behind this urge for us to make things? Why is it that our generation is not happy to just sit and take what we also want to opinionate, we also want to criticize, we want to have impact on the things that are done? Uh, there are several reasons why someone become a maker and start doing something. Um, it could be because of money, you make a living out of it, you make videos on YouTube, you get paid by sponsorship, we can make things on Etsy and people buy them, S that's fair. Uh, some people just love doing it. They do it because they like it and they can help themselves. They cannot not do it, right? That's the case from any modder, for instance. People who make mods for your game, levels for your games, they do it because they want. They're not expecting to be paid. If they get paid, great, but they're not expecting that. They do it because something bigger inside them tells them, I need to do this. Uh, some people have a story or a message to tell. They make a game or they make a mod, a level, a commentary because they want to give you a new perspective on things, right? But in our experience, the people who are most successful of creating content have all three. They do it because they have it savvy enough that they know they can make money of it. They do it because they cannot help themselves. They have to do it. And they do it because they have a context, a perspective. I stand for this and this is why I'm doing it. These tend to be the most successful of them all. Uh, and this fascinated us to no end because if you are a game developer, you are also a maker. You couldn't be a game developer without making, being a maker. And the question in our heads was, are we different from them? We are here every single day creating games and getting into the night and we have no lives other than just making games, as I'm sure every game developer shared this <laughs> reality with us. Uh, are we the same? Do they feel like that? Do they operate in those, in those uh, parameters? And surprisingly, the answer was yes. So when it came for us to work on a new game called Worlds of Drift, which Ivan nicely introduced, uh, um, it was a very ambitious game concept, right? If we wanted to do this game, we would need 150, 200 people to work on it, and that's not the kind of studio we are. 
Uh, it does a lot of things that no other game has done before, like multiplayer physics or persistency, player agency over the world. There was no way that uh, we could do this game on our own. So I will show you a quick video of Worlds of Drift for the benefit of people who have not seen it yet. So you can kind of figure out exactly how big and transformational the game is. And I will have to do it that outside of PowerPoint because PowerPoint is not behaving with me. Sorry for that. Guy. We explore together. We are united. And feared. Nope. This is our story. Memories of the past. Sorry for that. Span the horizon. It's not showing. We'll get there. Eventually. Right. Okay, I had to quit PowerPoint. Okay. In an endless sky, we explore together. We are united and feared. This is our story. Memories of the past span the horizon. Each island is unique. A safe haven. A home to treasure and mysteries. Danger is everywhere. To find answers, we built. To survive, we learned. We crafted bigger ships. Faced bigger threats. Voyaged into the unknown. Journey on. We seek answers. We seek together. We seek safety. And we fight together. Yours be. Right, so let's get back to the presentation here and hope it works. Yeah. Right, so World of Drift is a huge, huge game where the players build their own ships piece by piece, and every time they add a new piece to the ship, it, it changes the physics quality of that ship. It behaves in a different way. Um, you fly with your crews around this endless sky, uh, the huge world of 2,500 kilometers, right? And you uncover the secrets in the world in each island in the sky that you visit and so on. It has, it's the first MMO uh, massive multiplayer game that has physics. So instead of me just slashing you with a sword and the number goes up, I can actually pick a rock and throw at you. I can cut down a tree and if it falls in your head, it kills you and all that. Uh, it has AI, so all the creatures in the game are driven by hunger, by sexual urges, by uh, being afraid that their ecosystem is being damaged and they, they, they don't have food anymore. They're entities that live, even if when the players are not there, they don't spawn out of nowhere. A new creature needs a male and a female to mate and generate an offspring and so on. So all the things that this game brings, uh, how could we afford to do that? 
Um, how can just 25 people create a game like this? There are only two or three options, really. Throw money at the problem. Money and people we can always do, right? You can throw 200 people and eventually we'll solve it. We could do it procedurally. There are algorithms that can create vast, incredible worlds. Uh, but the fallback on that, the, the pitfall of procedural is that machine cannot add secrets, cannot add story, cannot add lore, right? You lift the rock and there's nothing hidden underneath. And once you figure the pattern of how the algorithm is creating the world, you know what to expect on e in each new island. And we could work with our players to help create this world together with a small team. And you know which answer, which we chose uh, to make it so. On the very first day that we decided that we would make this game, we went online and made a video for the players saying, this is the game idea. This is what we're going to do. Do you think we should do this game? Are you guys vested on this? And we were honestly prepared that if the answer was no, we will kill the game there and there. But because they said yes, and because we asked them if we will make that game, and they, say, and th they said go ahead, they started to be co-developers with us. It was in their power to green light the game. And so it was in their responsibility to make that game happen as well. From there, we open up the game development roadmap to the players. So our roadmap is public. People know what we are working on, they know what we're gonna work next, and they know what to expect in the future. And because they have this visibility, all the discussions we have with the players are framed by this visibility. So we don't have these wild tangents of people saying, why we don't have flying dinosaurs? No, because it's not there. We don't talk about these things. It's a new idea, so you have to upvote it and maybe make it there and so on. Uh, there are many examples of how people are doing this successfully. If you look at uh, things like uh, uh, Subnautica, for instance, it's a game that was built wi with the community because the team who created that game is a, m uh, is a team of modders, right? They, they came from natural selection. It was a very popular mod for Half-Life. It was Counter-Strike, Firearms, Day of Defeat, and Natural Selection. Those were the four big mods back in the day. And the team who created Subnautica were modders, so they understand how to interact with the players. And there is a, a good team uh, called Amplitude in France who make endless dungeons, endless space. They actually have a platform where players put their ideas there. The other players upvote and downvote. They comment and so on. And then the developers go and pick the ideas and put inside the development track. This is how advanced some studios are starting to uh, deal with their communities and use them as a resource to help them craft better games. So. Working with games, wi wi with the community, for us at least, has been a marvelous experience. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples. Uh, you know when you typically have to delay a game. You have a community, people are waiting for your game, and you say, you know what, w we will need to push the date in six months. Usually, particularly if you are a big company, uh, is hell on earth. Everybody is just going nuts on the forums and being terrible, toxic to you. When we did that, uh, this is the kind of feedback we got please do delay the game. We don't think the game is ready. We want more. We want to work with you for longer. Take your time. I've never seen a reaction from a community to an announcement of a delay, and this is what we got. And when we delayed the game, they understood why, because they wanted us to delay. They know what else wasn't in the game because they could see the roadmap, and they know what they wanted to make into the game before we made it available publicly. And this is the kind of feedback we got from them. They thanked us for delaying the game. This is a rare moment and one that exemplifies how much vested your community can be on your development journey if they work with you from the beginning and they understand why you make the decisions you make. Very few people make decisions because they are evil, because they're stupid. If they were stupid, they were not making games. Uh, but because there's a break in, co in communication between developers and players, they don't understand why you make this, the decision, so they infer. And by inferring, they get it wrong, and then toxicity uh, breaks up. Of course, some of them have different ways to, to incentivize us, but if we take it all on stride, and it all helps, sometimes we need to be pushed a little bit more to do our work well. <coughs> so for you to make it work with the players, uh, for you to be able to get the best out of your community. Let's say tomorrow you decide, you know what, I'm making this game, and I will make this game with the players. I'm going to tell them that I'm making this game. I'm going to ask them if I should make this game. I'm going to make the forums available to them. I'm going to find channels on Discord. I'm going to build my own platform like Amplitude did. Uh, I'm going to do this. So what are the things that uh, you will have to do? The first and most important thing you have to think of is which tools you're going to give your players 
for them to create the content with your team? And which systems will enable them to upload and compare their content with each other and with your team? You will not succeed if you, make, if you treat them as game developers because they're not being paid for it. They don't, will not work on it every day. They will not have the, the report with you that a staff or someone in your team has. So you've got to make it easy for them to have access. So these are the four rules that we have at the studio. First, because players are not professionals, some of them will be, but not all of them, the disparity between their skill set is huge. If you go in your studio and pick the best developer and the most junior developer, their skill set differences around this, right? This much. If you pick your best player and your most new green player, the disparity will be that. So your tool set has to have two, two aspects of it. First, it has to be very, very accessible. You have to just pick up and go, but it has to be very deep because the very advanced players and the very advanced people creating content will want to be able to tweak and look at the under the hood and do things that you didn't think they would want to do or they were even capable of doing. So you have to think in those ways. It's very easy to get in, but very advanced feature-wise, allowing them to do much more than you will be comfortable with. And you will be pleasantly surprised, trust me. The second one, you have to make frictionless to share. Whatever players create have to be very easy for them to send over to you and to the other players to have access to. They have to work side by side with your team. You cannot work on things here and the players work on things there. It has to be all the same thing. Your team needs to be able to see what the players are doing. The players need to be see what your, what, what your team is doing. The third one is that once things start to work out and players can upload their content, they can see what each other are doing, you have to pick up the best ones in that community and put them up in the hill, in the pedestal. Why you do that? You will raise the standard for everybody else. Uh, when we started on Worlds of Drift, the first islands we got, they, they were okay, they were good, but they were not, oh my God, this is amazing. But then a new island came in, it was really good. And then another one was better than the ones we did. And so, oh my God, so we put it up there and the players saw what that player did and they started to copy that. And then they made islands were better. And then they started to compete with one another in a very healthy way and created this feedback loop of, of learning from one another and creating ever increasing quality levels that one day today is much higher than we could afford with our own teams. Professionals at our studio cannot do islands as well as our players can because some of these guys had 3,000 hours on the island editor already. Um, and the fourth one is that you have to s listen to your players when they're starting to work on the game content. Treat them just as you would treat a, a staff or a team member on, on your team. If someone that's sitting next to you would say, you know what, why don't we add this feature? You have to treat that exactly as a player will tell you through the forums because they are now working with you. They are now part of your ecosystem. So think of the players as an extension of the team rather than a dissection between your team and your players. Yeah. And uh, this is where it could go horribly wrong because I will do a live demo now showing what I mean by the tool that I just described it here. Fingers crossed. So this is the Worlds Adrift Island created. This is what the players and my team use when they want to make an island. Right? This is how it starts. It starts with just that. Oh, sorry. God. This was not... <laughs> Very sorry. You get it now? There, sorry. This is how the island creator starts. Very simple, just have a geometry form here. And then I can add another geometry form. Let's say I add this sphere here and I move it with my horrible mouse around here, raise it a little bit, and I add another one, let's say a capsule and I'm gonna rotate around this axis here, a little bit banking here, and we'll move it there. And then I'm gonna generate an island based on this. There you go. I have an island roughly with the shape that I established it with just those very simple things. And then I can start, of course, changing the shape I want. I want this to be more depressed over here. 
or I want this here to be slightly higher. Uh, let's say, uh, let's put some, some grass around here. Or let's look at some trees, why not? Put some palm trees, we're in Barcelona after all. Right, and uh, let's just put a couple of rocks just to make it lived on. Let's put this piece of building here. Oh, it's too big. Let's do something smaller. Something like that. Right? And then I just jump in and check out how's it going. Yeah, I kind of like this. Palm trees. Oh, that's a big thing there. Put a bit of coal in. Raise myself over there. But you see how easy it is for me to test the game and the content I'm generating, right? It has to be like that. And the end result is that some of these islands that the players create, there will be a lot of stadia today like that because it's World Cup. So I, I never see a stadia made before, and just today when I was preparing here, I already saw two of them. So you're happy to be prepared for these things you don't expect. But uh, we have more than 10,000 of these islands made by the players, and uh, the quality level of this content is just amazing. Look at that. It's unbelievable, and I'm just picking one at random, right? I'm just going down here. But you can see on side of Steam how the people start to comment on one another and, and, and they recognize each other. Like this guy is saying, oh, you're a city hero, uh, city wizard, meaning that every city you make is great, and so on. So don't think that by bringing the players in, you're compromising equality. It's the other way around. You're actually getting better quality than otherwise. And now we'll show you a slightly old video of islands made by players. Hey, there we go. So, you have given the players the tools to create. You created the ecosystem for them to share, like we did in workshop on Steam, that they can share the levels and the islands and the groups of objects they put together, forming wonderful buildings, etc. It's now time to ensure that all this is working smoothly for you, that they are happy, that you are happy, and the content is making it into the game, and things are progressing in an ever-evolving way. So, these are the six rules we have in place that we figured out have helped us to achieve that. I think that for each one of you, you will have a slightly different set of rules, but this is a good start as any, okay? So, just like there are people who create great things, like go and create islands, or go and create levels, or skins, or models, or new systems for the game, or improve scripting language, or whatever, there are also people who contribute in other ways. There will be people who will be just cheering them along, people who will be making videos and tutorials of how to use the, your editors and your systems, people who will be talking about it on Facebook, on Twitter, on forums, etc. They are just as important as the people making the content, okay? So make sure that when someone is doing something great, doesn't matter how small it is, you go there and lift them up to show the rest of the community an example of how positive behavior can improve and contribute to the making of the game. It's like leading by example, but it's not your example. It's your community's example for the community itself. 
that's super powerful. It's much more powerful than you telling them how to behave. You just pick people behaving inside the community and you say, this is the right way to do it, and the community gets it. Uh, the second one is that game development is not a democracy, right? Uh, this is super important. The fact that your players are helping you make the game doesn't mean that they control how the game is made. It's still your game. The only thing that pleases everybody is the minimum common denominator, and the minimum common denominator, more often than not, is very boring. The things that are very interesting sometimes, most of the times, they don't, they don't please everyone. So don't try to make it a democracy. Don't try to please everybody. And by, uh, by, by all means, keep control of your authorship of the game because it's your game. Okay? Um, and the way that you do that is using two, uh, uh, um, two other tricks. Um, first, never hide from a problem. When there is something going wrong, you tell them. Because if they understand when something goes wrong and why it's going wrong, they will understand why you're making decision X, Y, and Z. And when they understand why you're making these decisions, they will get in the same wavelength as you, and they, they will start to anticipate the decisions you will make next in the future. So you're all working towards the same goal. You won't even have to say, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this. Everybody will be on the same page. It will be very organic, as long as you are clear and honest with them all over the place, all the time. Never hide from a mistake. There's no point of doing this. There's nothing wrong uh, with keeping it candid, good and bad. What is very wrong is when they find out that you didn't tell them and something was going wrong. Right? Uh, the fourth point is that if you have a bad element in your community, and it will happen because some people just want to see the world burn, uh, try to turn it around. Do that immediately. But if it doesn't work, get rid of it. Kill it with fire. Uh, you can turn people around, but it takes a lot of energy from you, and more often than not, they are doing it because they want to be heard by others, or they want to spread that sentiment. So be very, very careful with bad elements in the community. You have to act fast. If they are doing something that is bad because they're misguided, they're very passionate about the game and they want you to hear, you'll be able to turn them around. That's fine. You call them on the side, you talk to them, they will understand and they will change. But some people will never change. They just want bad. They are trolls. So get rid of them as soon as possible, otherwise you'll have a toxic community in your hands because they spread very fast. Uh, if there's something they want, they give you good feedback on it, say this is important for the game, but you don't think you're going to do it for any reason, tell them right away and why explain why. Don't try to procrastinate or put that decision down the line because that's, that's a bad mistake. It will come to, to bite your back when it doesn't happen. Right? And uh, lastly, be your own version of yourself. Be who you are. You are an interesting person, otherwise you wouldn't be, game, be, be making games. Every game developer is a hero for the players. They want to be game developers if they could, and they want to be game developers if they invest the time on being. So you are interesting by default. Don't try to create a persona or a character that you have to update and upkeep, right? Eventually that character will fall apart because you're not an actor, and they will figure out that it was all smoke and mirrors and they will detach from your community. So be yourself, just be yourself, and they will love you for what you are, whatever it is that you are. So with these few tips, uh, uh, I hope that I have helped you feel inspired in a new way to create games. Uh, I tell you from the bottom of my heart, for us have been nothing but a positive experience. And I have seen three or four other studios starting to make games with their players. And I've seen never, none of them to go back to the old ways. So there must be something going wrong, going well there. Otherwise, they would have changed. But they haven't. Uh, we haven't. We will never make a game uh, isolated from our players ever again. Uh, I don't think Amplitude will. And with the runaway success of uh, Subnautica, I don't think those guys will do anything different as well. So pay attention to this. If you feel inclined to do so, give it a go. Because it feels like this is the way the game should be built in the future. Just because this is the way that players think today as makers, as people who want to make part of the journey of any content that they want to be uh, consumers of. Uh, thank you very much, and I will now open for questions. So ti time for, sorry, time for questions now. Um, I, I would like to throw you one first question before they start is like um, if you could tell us a little bit more about how a spatial OS uh, was important for for the game uh, oh yes of course. what is what is the platform a little bit of overview of what is the platform and why is a good fit for your game and why you need for this kind of game this kind of platform to be evolved okay uh, the, the, the bossa as a uh, is a very 
technology-centric company, like in, in that we use cutting-edge technology. But we use technology as a means to an end. We don't use technology for the sake of it. We only use technology uh, when enable us to do something that's interesting gameplay-wise. When we look at MMOs, uh, how they were traditionally done, and I, I am an MMO player since Ultima Online. Actually, I was playing multi-user dungeons in text uh, 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 terminals back in, uh, in the 80s. Um, the games evolved in a way they, they felt very linear. So I go here, talk to an NPC, he gives me a quest, I go kill 10 rats, bring their tails, and they give me the XP so I can proceed and go to the next uh, stage of the journey, right? It felt very constricted and very different from uh, what the maker's generation is experiencing today with Minecraft, which throws you into a world, there are no missions, there are no NPCs, and by the way, if you don't find shelter before the sun goes down, you're gonna be dead, right? So the players start to call MMOs as uh, 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 theme parks where they felt strapped to a car, they can only do what the game was telling them to do. We wanted to break that, and that's what Wars of Drift was about. But in order to add things like multiplayer physics, persistency, meaning that if I cut down a tree, the tree is, f is felled forever, or uh, to have my creatures mate and s generate a spawn instead of just coming out of spawn points that I can camp and kill them when they come, we needed to create a lot of technology that doesn't exist. Just solving the problem of physics multiplayer in an MMO, oh, my it's like, I don't want to touch that with a barge pole. And that's what Special OS did, right? They, they, they do these things very easily. They, 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 uh, each shard of Words of Drift is 450 cores uh, running physics simulator, and each one of those talk to one another. So uh, if I am here and I fire a cannonball, and the, the, the other player is in another server, the cannonball goes between our servers. Physics engines handle that, that cannonball, including a threshold transition from one server to the other, and you don't see anything. You don't see the physics going wacky and badly, and you end on the other player. This is the kind of technology that Spatial OS does. So Words of Drift as it is, it wouldn't be possible without Spatial OS. But that's a very specific case. Spatial OS is very powerful if you know what to do with it, and your game requires it to do something that hasn't been done before in that particular way. D did I answer it? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um. Who's got a question? Who's got the first question? Hi, great talk, very interesting. Uh, what do you know about uh, <coughs> the, the the players or the makers, as you call them? Mm. Uh, where are they from? Age, uh, gender? It is super spread. They reflect the player base in, in, in integrally. There is no distinction between the makers and the player base itself. Um, they have more available time. That's one of the characteristics of the makers. They have more spare time, right? Uh, I, I think that the, the, the most prolific island creator we have on workshops has invested something like 3,000 hours already on the game editor. Uh, and there are streamers who have accumulated more than 10,000 hours in the game. But they're makers just as well. They're creating content with the game, right? So there is the aspect of they have disposable time to invest in the journey of the game. But otherwise, in terms of gender split, uh, demographics or even country distribution, they are spread just like any other uh, player base I have been in contact with. There's okay. nothing particular about the country or anything like that. Age, age groups? Uh, again, spread. Yeah. Uh, we see, we see uh, the older people generate the better quality of content. The younger people generate the more quantity of content. But they learn very fast. We see the younger people generating content uh, that is tentative and uh, the, the curve of the quality of content is much more sharper than the older generation, which it starts creating better content to begin with. Mm. So maybe because they have, they're close to the max out of their abilities while the others are just in the inflection point of being very smart about it, mm. which, which is natural, it's human. I don't think it's anything to do particularly with games. It's the way that every maker generates content. Yeah. Uh, so how much do you know about the makers? We know a fair, fairly amount. Uh, uh, there is a limited amount of content we know uh, how they think, for instance. We only anecdotally, right? We, we bring a lot of them into the studio, talk to them, and the feedback they give us through all the channels, ranging from Discord to forums to email, whatever, right? So we learn about them like that. Um, but there are no analytics that can give us our that kind of insight. They cannot peer into people's mind, and we don't even try because we know that that, that, that would not yield the results we want. It has to be more anecdotal than that. In terms of what the players do, uh, yes, we have everything, right? It's when, where they die, what they struggle with, where are they having the most fun of. In fact, one of the new projects we have 
um, which has AI as a game director on top of everything. So the AI create the levels dynamically on the fly. We training that AI with the levels of the player created in World of Drift. So it, it sees what the levels, where in those levels the players have fun, what they struggle, what they like about level A or B, and the machine learning learns that those aspects of those levels. Wow. And are now able to generate uh, procedural levels which are interesting mm -hmm. and add twists to it. Machine learning on top of procedural is, is something that is different from just procedural that we have seen in the past in games like No Man's Sky and Elite and so on, right? Uh, the, the you don't figure the patterns anymore because the machine learning is twisting the patterns all the mm -hmm. time and is using a seed player behavior, which is very different from a pure algorithm. Right. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm now digress. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm kind of interested in where you think uh, things are headed or like what would you predict about the percentage of, uh, of people who are, you know, the creators and makers ah. uh, versus the players and yeah, then yeah, yeah. this new category of just w spectators. Uh, it it's usually between one and three percent of your of your user base will be creators, and you will find that number everywhere, from Wikipedia to uh, YouTube and so on, is increasing over time. Uh, when we started, it was between one and two to three percent. We are now at five and seven, and you can see that trend again in other content-generated platforms, or crowdsourced platforms like Wikipedia and so on. The the ratio is increasing. Uh, but it is, again, is human nature. The, the, the top end will always produce the better and more appreciated content, right? It is, it's just how humans behave. Um, and, of course, a majority of people are happy to consume, but in the knowledge that they could produce. It's interesting. We have 250,000 downloads of the island creator, but only 10,000 islands actually created with it. A lot of people played with it, created islands, but never uploaded them. They're not interested in that. But they're interested in the knowledge that when and if I want, I, I could. And that already kind of sinks back to this impetus of being a maker, of being a creator, of making part of the journey. You know? it's I, I think it's the same thing for YouTubers. Eventually, even if you're not a YouTuber creator, you will record yourself talking about the subject and you will upload to YouTube. The knowledge that I can do that already kind of put me in the mindset as a maker. It's I don't have to do it every day or as a living, or even at all, to consider myself a maker, I think. More questions over there? Yeah. Um, well, uh, <laughs> uh, talking about the content made by players, and since some time we've been taking a look at modding uh, video games and the like, and recently there's been a controversy about uh, paying the players that make uh, stuff for, for a game. Uh -huh. So what do you think uh, it would be a right uh, way of mm, looking at it and would you encourage to pay your creators for saying like that or they they should be be proud of making something for for you uh th there are two stages of this uh, i must say the the stage we live today is is that it's absolutely fine for people to monetize their creation i think it should happen right we have we had a setback on steam uh, a year or so ago uh, when games that had free mods all of a sudden got into the system and made those free mods into pay mods. That was the core of the backlash, right? And it got, uh, the whole discussion got hijacked into, oh, mods should be free, this is the in-world into, into the, uh, uh, the game development career, so people should not be paid by mods, we don't want to pay by mods. Th that's not true at all. You go on Dota and you see that. You buy characters made by players that Valve elect to go into the shop and nobody complains about it. What people really complain about is they now have to pay for mods that were already free. It's the same content, right? I have no games that monetize player content, and there's no problem at all with that. Nobody complains about it. And it's only fair. You invest the time in content, you want people to appreciate that, and you want to be paid for it. So the future of uh, uh, player-created content being monetized for the players, for me, is not a question. It's going to happen, and it has to happen. It's fair. Then there is the second stage, which is more philosophical. I don't know if it's going to come to pass or not, which is the whole debate about AI displacing workforce, right? Uh, people lose their jobs because AI are replacing them, and how far that will go. There is a line of thought that say people could find meaning and definition of selves by playing games and living in virtual worlds. And by doing that, they earn a living out of the gig economy or whatever you want to call it. So. I can be paid for playing with people who pay to play. So I am 
replacing an NPC, if you wish, as a player. And I get paid for that because the, the high-end consumer, the high-end player is paying to have that kind of experience. But this is a more philosophical debate. If Scrummer comes to pass or not, remains to be seen. But to the core of your question, for me, it's not a doubt there's going to become more of a trend that people will expect to be paid by the content they generate. And you see that in games like Roblox and whatnot. It's already happening a lot. So following up that question, uh, what, what do you think should be the, or will be the business model for this kind of games? Like in a uh, in I, I would years imagine it will be revenue share of content, right? It could well be that you don't charge for any game anymore. It's just you give the game as a platform, the players start to create content from one another, and that is the main revenue model. This is certainly working for uh, a, a few mobile games now that enable players to create mods and, and in-game experiences that they, they sell. Uh, the developers do the broker, uh, and, but the majority of the revenue comes from being the broker between that transaction. So this seems to be working. I see no reason why this would be held back, why this would stop. Of course, there are type of games which are narratives. So it's like someone has a vision on start, mid, and end, and they want to tell that story. That's a linear story. That's perfectly fine, and that's how it should be experienced. But when you're talking about sandbox, when you're talking about MOBAs, when you're talking about things that enable players to add to the game content, I don't see a future where they are not rewarded by what they create. More questions? Uh, since you're making these uh, makers where you involve the players to participate in the game making, uh -huh. uh, do you see the possibility of someone investing so much time, so much, so much effort in the game that you could see the possibility of hiring him if he shows the skills? of participating uh, on the game in like real time, not as maker, but as a game developer. Do you see game developers arising from the makers community? Absolutely, it happens. It happens to us, it happens to everyone. Uh, I have seen that happen a lot. Well, case in point, uh, the people who develop Counter-Strike, the mod, got hired by Valve to create Counter-Strike Source and Counter-Strike Go. The same people, they're the modders. Um, Subnautica itself is made by a, by a team of modders who created natural selection and so on. So it's a natural trend. Some, some companies do that. Uh, at Bossa we do. We hire members of the community into the team as soon as we see that they have something uh, um, uh, that they can contribute to the, to the effort, right? And if we have the position, we open to them first. There's no better curriculum than that, is it? There's no better portfolio than I have work on your game and I know what I'm doing. Uh, but this happens for a long time. This is not new. Is that is not well well it's not too public. I don't know how many people know that uh, as a tradition, Valve hire entire teams of modders, like the, the, the team who created Nabacular uh, Gates or Nabacular something, which is the inspiration for Portal, the mechanical Portal of the Gates. That was a team fresh from university. They found them on a game expo. They hired the entire team and they put them to work on Portal. So this kind of things happen. The fact that they are creating content for your game, in the case of, of Counter-Strike, or even identifying someone who has created a game and bring them in, it's something that happens a long time on, on the games industry. And that will happen more often. Um, if I see someone creating a great, a great island in Worlds of Drift, I want that person as a level designer if I have a project next uh, that is happening. So you're absolutely right. That happens a lot. One more question. Over there. Hi. Uh, great game, by the way. <laughs> Going back to the technical question, uh, regarding a spatial OS, uh -huh. uh, you have a very particular requirements uh, for, for the technology. So for which kind of games would you recommend spatial OS and for which ones you wouldn't? Oh, it's a good question. Um, because spatial, it brings, every new technology brings new paradigms with it. Any new technology that is worth your time bring new paradigms with it. The problem is we are humans, we we tend to define new things by old terms. So people used to call locomotives iron horses when they first saw it, right? You call your, your mobile like a mobile phone. This is anything but a phone. You use it less as a phone and more of an email reader. So why is not an email, a mobile reader or something like that? So we, train, we tend to define new things using known and old terms. So 
yes, you could make, uh, say, better grounds with a thousand people. Obvious, you can do that on Spatial OS. But I'm shoehorning my preconcept, my game design ideas into what it could expand on. I think that what's in very interesting, the potential for that technology is what we have, we don't know about. What kind of new design paradigms, what kind of design, game design decisions and core mechanics can only be done in that kind of technology that will enable us to create games that have never, never happened before. So Worlds of Drift is a lot of old stuff in new setup and new scale and new, like physics is not new to games. Physics in an MMO is. Uh, persistency is not new to games. Single player games do that a lot. Persistency on massive online games is new. So you see that we, we, we have used old concepts and packaged it, it together. So I can tell you anything that you want to do in a bigger scale, it will help. It will shortcut you and get you to that scale much faster than any other technology I know of. Um, but I think that the more interesting is what I don't know that could be done with the technology. So, so physics, persistency, uh, anything that you want to simulate when the players are not around is very good at because the, 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 the entities is an entity-based engine. Uh, they are running on the background all the time. So we, are, we have that joke, if there, there is no one on the forest and the tree falls, does it really fall? On spatial OS, it does. If, if not there, it, it falls. So that enables you to simulate AI very well. Uh, NPCs that roam around have their own ob objectives and their own motivations, uh, despite the players are not being there and so on. So these kind of things it does very well, and I would recommend uh, you have a look at it if your game has that kind of peculiarity. Uh, can I have another, just another question? Uh, uh, so have you thought about uh, if it will have an increased computational cost in terms of servers? Because it, it looks yes. like it's very intensive in terms of... Oh, it, it depends on the use you make. Right, uh, Worlds of Drift uh, uh, ticks at every, uh, 50 hertz. Uh, it used to tick at 120 hertz. So every second, 120 times. Now it's 50. Uh, but if you make a game which is, say, turn-based, or something that requires to tick only a couple of times a second, like RuneScape did when we worked on it, that will impact your cost, right? Uh, Worlds of Drift, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the special OS formula right now has to do with how many cores you are using. We use a lot of cores because of the physics simulation. If your game doesn't have physics, you probably have 10% of our cost. Right? So it's a very elastic, depending on what kind of use you make. There's no fixed cost to it uh, per se. OK, so that, that is all for the moment. Thank you very much, Enrique, Thank you very for, much, for coming, for Thanks joining for us. Thanks for inviting me, folks. Thank you. Thank you.